Um, I think we do have something that potentially we want to uh, potentially vote on, although it may also need to go back and, and get some <laughs> editing. We'll see. Um, so good morning. Welcome, everybody. Um, you saw the uh, antitrust reminder, so don't antitrust. Uh, today we have a, a fairly light agenda, although I suspect that maybe the copyright license discussion may take up a little bit of time. Um, and uh, so we have Indy, so Nathan will do the Indy update, um, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then that's it. So um, uh, any other items for the agenda other than what we have here? If not, and then Todd, I'd actually like to let Nathan go first, just so we get that in and don't run the clock or anything. Sure. I don't know that it came in, uh, but it might have in the oh. last little bit. Uh, Nathan, do you... So actually, I think this is the first that I heard of it. So I I missed the first few minutes of last week's part. You know, so I I actually didn't have an, an update prepared for today. So I apologize Nathan. for that. Well, you can go first, but. <laughs> But nothing. And next, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, Nathan, you'll be first up next week, and then hopefully we'll also get um, uh, Silas uh, on. I don't see him right now, but uh, I think we'll send a reminder just to make sure. Okay. That so, would be great, and I will be ready for that next week. <laughs> super. Thanks. All right. So um, we have a really potentially short call. So let's get rolling, Todd, with the HackFest. All right, sounds good. Um, dropping the agenda into the Rocket Chat. I think uh, we're about seven weeks out now. We've got a lot of people registered for this already. Great to see the interest for that. Uh, already 60 for the HackFest, about 90 for the, the day zero. Mm -hmm. um, and I suspect that'll climb over the next seven weeks. But I think uh, Tracy and I were chatting yesterday, wanted to think a little bit about putting some more structure in place for this. Uh, yeah, we've got a bit more runway this time, and kind of how do we how do we structure this um, this time around? So, what goes into the day zero training? There's a lot of interest around that. Uh, good audience for that, and then for the next two days, uh, I know we you know want to have an eye towards cross project collaboration, actual hacking, yes. uh, potentially some work group meetings. What is the what is the best structure, and then how do we seed some topics for that um, so that people hit the ground running while they're there? Yeah, I, I agree. So, um, uh, where's my chat? Chat, chat, chat? I haven't looked at the agenda recently. Come on. Yeah, so in terms of what's in the Google Doc, it's really bare bones at this point. It's, just kind okay. of, yeah. Um, but I think, you know, if there's specific things that the different projects want people to be hacking on, uh, if there's cross project uh, ideas around cross project collaboration, uh, ways to bridge communities, to get those thoughts in there with more specific asks um, and parameters around it. Uh, and then in terms of the training, is there any work that we can do in advance and blast out to the attendees right. to get them set up? Because I know kind of downloading some stuff was a limiting factor in LA and other mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah, yeah I think. I think for day zero right now, the agenda just has a copy of what we did in LA. And so I think it's worthwhile to spend some time thinking about whether or not that worked, right? Did the lightning right. talks work? Um, and then what kind of actual um, sessions do we want? Um, which, which of the frameworks or projects are we going to be uh, doing demos on or, or not demos, but uh, training on as far as like getting people set up and those sorts of things. Yeah. So that, uh, you know, we can take some time maybe a week before and just, you know, set up some VMs that people could download and have on their machines to, to actually um, not have to worry right. about any sort of Wi-Fi wi -Fi yeah. issues. So <clears throat> the one thing that I thought was <clears throat> a little bit awkward about LA was that everybody's sort of 101 session or, you know, maybe 102 was at the same time and so you had to choose which 
isn't necessarily ideal if the objective is to get people sort of familiar. Um, and a 10 minute lightning talk isn't necessarily enough time to really sort of um, do much more than here's where we are, here's what we are, uh, but you can't really get into much detail. In 10 minutes, I'm just wondering if we, uh, you know, <clears throat> if we, uh, if we want to spend a little bit more time on, uh, certainly with the platforms to, you know, make their case for uh, a little bit deeper dive. And then maybe then people are in a position that they might want to choose or and, and then maybe a little bit less time with, you know, getting set up and, you know, submitting your first transaction or something. I, 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 I don't know. I, I just, I, I felt that it was awkward because people had to choose. Um, and then there was complete separation. And I think we could go back. I think when we were originally looking at this, one of the suggestions was to do maybe three of the projects, um, each one by itself as opposed to parallel tracks yeah that that you know that might be you know a better idea and then you could maybe spend the last couple hours in a day maybe you want to focus on one of them right um, um the, the other track that would be very interesting to me i know this is one of the most productive things i was able to do in la was we had kind of an architectural comparison session between sawtooth uh -huh. and indy and we walk through the similarities and differences. And at yeah. least for, for the indie maintainers, that was actually one of the best ways to learn about how Sawtooth is put together. And it would be nice yeah. to do some of that with the other projects. Yeah, we could, that, that, that's another way of, of dealing with it is having, instead of having each project do a, 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 you know, its own thing that you could have maybe a collaborative comparison and discussion of the differences between the various platforms that might be worthwhile. Um, might even record that and use it for other things. So, so that's a good idea, I, Nathan. I agree with hard. Nathan that that was yeah. extremely useful, but I think that's more of a, uh, of a thing that people who are really experienced with the projects want to be doing mm. um, rather than kind of an introduction. Um, I just had a question. Uh, the previous Hackfests, have we had like a really high percentage of people ready to code? Because a lot of the people that are new that I talk to are just, you know, kind of coming to learn about the project. Um, or, or even like business side people that have just like no interest in coding whatsoever. Do we have like an accurate count of kind of uh, how big this sort of population is? Because this might be a reason why, you know, we're having trouble hacking just because we've got a lot of business people. Right. Um, I, I'm trying to recall what we had in LA. When I recall, you know, doing the, let's set up your machine, let's get you, you know, running here on your, on your laptop or whatever. I think we had, you know, maybe six in the fabric one. Uh, I don't know, Dan and, and Nathan, how many you guys had. Um, I know Dan's having trouble with his phone. Yeah, on the indie side, we didn't end up with a different room for the 101 session, so we kind of ended up launching straight into the, yeah. the meetings with the Sawtooth folks. So we didn't really have a specific 101 other than hallway track kind of thing. Okay. We gave introductions to four or five people there, but obviously there wasn't a session right. conflict with that. So, you know, Hart, maybe to your point, maybe, yeah, maybe that's, that's you know, they, they really do just want to sort of understand what's the difference between the various platforms. Why might I choose to use, you know, one over the other, or, you know, what are the, what are the benefits of using one in certain use cases? I mean, again, I think everything is going to be, you know, uh, you know, sort of dependent on well, what are you trying to do, right? Uh, yeah, hi, you... this is this is Leonard. Um, Todd, I think I agree. Um, I think, well, everyone who spoke really. Uh, these are very much, um, you might say, information sessions for most people who turn up who aren't coders, okay, who aren't the maintainers, but have a strong desire to learn about different platforms and their strengths. 
So either, yes, we do a comparison in terms of the features, how one is different from the other, or we just have something like an hour's, uh, you might say, talk on each of the platforms because there is strong interest. I can, I can advise you on every of the platforms. I have two small clients, and although they're fabric oriented, but there is talk about uh, sources and which one should we use. And now, just recently launched, is the, uh, the new Ethereum standard, whereby uh, the focus is making it uh, an enterprise platform and focusing on privacy now and scalability. So people come into these sessions really need to understand the strengths of the platforms and be able to compare that with Ethereum as well to make that the right decision in terms of a solution base going forward. And that's where the strength of Hyperledger lies in that we have all these various platforms suited for slightly different, but Fabric can do both permissioned and permissionless depending on how uh, the smart contracts are coded and the access that uh, you might say um, <clears throat> requirements for, for that platform. Very important, I think, in the introductory section. Now, if the Hackfest is two, three days, by the second day, we can get into more detail and focus more on, you might say, the coding, <laughs> hacking aspects of it. But, ha but having given people a good ground in the platforms the day before, the day zero. Um, so yeah. I think it's a very good, um, you might say, agenda and, and strategy to follow. So I was actually going to suggest something a bit like that. I was like, you know, why don't we keep the intro day high level, no hands on type of things. And then we can, you know, direct people who are interested in getting their hands on, you know, first experience. We did that at the first Agfest where we were just helping people get their environment set up, right? And we did that as, as part of the Hackfest. I think, you know, I wouldn't mind helping people get set up on Fabric on the second day. Yeah, I think, I think you know, people told me that they need to learn how to start talking about the why, right? So it's easier if we kind of show them what they can do as a motivation to why they should set up the systems and integrate and try to build stuff and run examples. I think it's important to see the high level first. Yeah, I agree. And it kind of yeah. makes a clean separation. The first day is kind of for everybody, high level, business people, all uh, just as much as developers. And then as part of the hack fest, you'd say, okay, if there are people who want to actually get their hands dirty, we can do that as part of that. Uh, the, the, the other option, could we, could we consider having uh, two different tracks? for multi days, maybe for two days, you know, one track for the beginners, business people, and continue starting the first day introduction and gradually uh, increase the level of, of uh, technical information. Uh, but right, but day, not like just one day, you know. No, I, uh, yeah, I, I hear you, Ben, but then again, there's only so many people to go around. And right. And you can only be in one place at a time. So, for instance, you know, if we wanted to do some sort of a collaborative thing between, you know, Fabric and Sawtooth and Indy, well, who, 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 who stays out and helps the, you know, the noobs, right? If, if we had enough people, I suppose that might be okay. But I think some of the projects are going to be somewhat stretched, and that might be somewhat challenging to sort of have um, that and um, you know the other thing that I observed and, and again I you know I'd like some feedback from you know some others but is and I think I mentioned this when we sort of did a little bit of a retrospective on LA was that the absence of having any sort of um, working group discussions was also somewhat of uh, a detriment to getting people to come. Um, and so I, I think we need to sort of bring back a little bit of that balance. I do want us to make sure that we're focusing on hacking and cross project, you know, collaboration and so forth. But I also think that it's important that we also get um, those whose, you know, primary focus is on, you know, whether it's the white paper, the architecture, identity, what have you. Maybe they'll have a full, you know, separate 
meeting, but you know, enabling them to get together and um, and have you know uh, ha have conversations at that level. Not necessarily hacking is also, I think, important. So, I I don't know that we're going to solve it all here, but you know, I think maybe we could take it to the mailing list and and people could suggest different approaches. I I, I think the keeping day zero sort of business and sort of high level, what are these things for? What can you do with them? What use cases are they useful for? Where are people using them? Maybe makes the most sense since that does seem to be primarily who's, who's showing up for the first day. But I do want to make sure that we do have an opportunity to get people up and running that, you know, for, and also, you know, Tracy, the, you know, submitting your first patch kind of session. Um, I know that all the projects are a little bit different in terms of the tooling, but some of this stuff is pretty much the same and, and getting people familiar with how things work from a, you know, from a tooling perspective, what tools are available and where they should go to find out how to connect, I think is also important. Mm -hmm. If we're going to do an overview of the different Hyperledger projects and, and compare them? Do we also want to do competitive analysis type of thing against, um, you know, some of the other main DLTs out there, like Ethereum or something? So if people are here to find out, you know, why they should use this. Yeah. Or is that crossing a line? <laughs> well, why, it's, why, it's, why? it's walking right up to it. <laughs> I, I, I do think that, you know, again, it, it's worthwhile to, to have some of that conversation. I would hope that it wouldn't get into some sort of a bashing thing. Um, um, no, but you know. But good, good point, Mark. But I, I, I think also having the work groups have an ability to also share what are they doing? What things are they focused on? What's their status? Um, is also, I think, an important thing for day zero. But you know, we like I think I think we have enough mature people, both in the TSC and in our communities, right? So we 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 should be you know when people are bashing sometimes fabric or Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever, right? Over the years, I was always answering politely and you know relatively in a calm way, right? So we don't have to go and bash Ethereum or any competing project. Or nobody should even see it as a competition, right? We're doing a multi-blockchain, multi-cloud. We have a multi-cloud sure. offering. And whenever people are asking me, what should I choose? And I'm telling them, do you need KYC? Do you have regulatory constraints? Do you need to know the identities of the validators? Okay, then let's look at the permission space. And then we show you like the three projects that we have in Hyperledger. Somebody says, I want open access, censorship resistance. You know, I want everybody to be able to join the network without any constraints. I say, okay, let's look at the other stack of, yeah. you know, and I'm not trying to put them like, to pit them against each other. But it's kind of informative, right? To, to tell people, let's look at what you're trying to do and then look at some of the tools that we offer. I, I think I, if you do that- I totally agree with that, Jonathan, because it's the strengths we are focusing on. And let's not forget, by the time Hyperledger Quilt comes out of incubation and becomes a product, mm -hmm. we will be integrating, we'll be interoperable with all the different platforms, including Ethereum. If there's a use case for that. Well, we yeah. actually have a theory and we have Burrow. So yeah, we have Burrow as an EVM that is standard. Yeah. So we can right. talk about the features that Ethereum provides and why solidity or why chain code. Do you have like Golang developer use the chain code? If you would like solidity and you have some legacy or some new code or it's, you know, I think, I think we can have a more, like, look, I'm, I'm being very careful because, you know, especially in the enterprise space and think about it, right? We are like one of the smallest companies in the space com compared to the conglomerates around us, right? So we're really very careful, not trying to bash anyone in any way, not in writing, not verbally. But, you know, I think the more informative we look, I think the stronger this organization looks like. Because if you right. need to educate people, you know, it's not necessarily have to be like a commercial offering. You can just educate people. Right. And well, that, that's why I said, I think we just have yeah. to be careful that it doesn't turn very into... Careful. Uh, you know, no, 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 oh, no, you're right. It's you very know. sensitive and it's very, you know, it's very volatile. And people right. tend to do that. Oh, did you say this? And, you know, some, some, how many times you were misquoted me, right? So, right. of course. So, but, but, but anytime you start getting into, you know, 
characterizing somebody else's work, it, it can sort of, you know, without them being able to sort of, you know, defend it, um, uh, even unintentionally, it can sort of devolve, right? It can yeah, yeah. end up, you know, oh, ours is great and theirs sucks, right? And even if it doesn't, you know, come out and directly say that, it ends up sort of having that sort of a flavor. And, um, I don't think we want to necessarily go there. Uh, right. and, 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 anyways, but, what we can do to mitigate that risk is to review the material before the hack fest to ensure that we have a sensible level. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it's communication to the people who turn up. So we can't say we are not going to communicate because we fear the worst. We, it's like in any webinar, seminar, etc. you've got to review the work beforehand and ensure there's a good balance in terms of delivering the, the information at the right level so people can make up their own minds based yeah, on right. the features and the strengths of each of the products. Thanks. Right. So there's, there's right. a lot of chat that basically says we should really move on because, and again, I, I did want to sort of suggest, let's take it to the mailing list and continue to discuss this. We can, we can bring it up again next week if we have time. Um, so the other agenda item is the... Um, uh, the copyright and license policy and could somebody paste that in the chat? I know I had it up, I thought, but oh yes, here it is. Uh, Tracy, you want to go over that? Yeah, sure. So um, there's been a lot of questions kind of as we've been going through kind of the license scanning and, uh, you know, trying to get things set up properly about both license headers as well as copyright headers and so uh, we've you know obviously reached out to the folks at the Linux Foundation uh, who can you know provide us with some some thoughts on this and uh, you know it, it made sense to kind of write this up as a, a place a starting place for us to have a discussion about what this policy looks like so most of this obviously came from um, our legal folks at the, the Linux Foundation and, uh, you know, I just kind of wrote it down as uh, a place for us to, to have some place to point people when they start asking about, you know, what sort of copyright should they put into their header files, as well as kind of the license headers, right? Um, so as, as we look at this, right, the, I think the, the challenge with the, the copyright notice that's still out there is this, this question of, is it, is it the right uh, notice for us to put in, in place, right? And I think the, the, the big thing here is that, you know, copyright is an interesting thing because it may be an initial um, copyright that comes in that says copyright company foo um, is correct when that first gets put in. But as soon as other people start making contributions to that, um, then the copyright really is not correct, right? Um, because the, the, the copyright is based on a lot of different contributions from a lot of different companies and or individuals. And so uh, the, the recommendation obviously is to uh, copyright it as Hyperledger to ensure that, you know, if there's any sort of issues that occur, that the, the project itself could um, be responsible for handling any of those sorts of issues. Um, so to, to, yeah. to the point on the copyright though, yeah. um, so I, I think uh, certainly, I would agree that, you know, if uh, I submitted something and said copyright, Chris, um, and then Tracy and Dan and somebody else come along and make some modifications to that, that it's no longer fully my copyright. It also belongs to Tracy and Dan and whoever mm -hmm. else. Um, uh, but it also says don't remove the copyright notice. So are you saying that what we should be doing is as other people add or modify the file that they should add a copyright hyperledger and its contributors to the existing and then leave it to if somebody wants to go through and, and remove the copyright Chris um, from that file, they can, they can do that. But otherwise there's just two lines, one that says copyright, you know, initial contributor and the other one that says hyperledger. So I, yeah, no, I, I specifically put in here in the third sentence right before the, the copyright line, 
uh, for new files added to Hyperledger repositories. This is the, the text that we should be including. I didn't say anything about what we should do for our previous files, the ones that already exist, right? I didn't, I, I really don't think, um, you know, it's, it's right for us to remove those copyright notices unless, um, you know, the, the person who originally submitted it wants to, to make that change, right? Um, so, I'm not a lawyer, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, maybe we have Mike on, I don't know, but to, is, is that correct? Or I thought that when you made contributions under Apache, you retain the copyright. So if I create a new file, shouldn't that, as, as an IBM or shouldn't that be copyright IBM? I'm not a lawyer either, Chris. I, yeah, I'm, unfortunately I, I do need somebody who has some legal expertise to comment on that. And it doesn't look like we have anybody on the call today who can do that. I didn't, I didn't see Mike. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually got a, an email out to, uh, uh, or a message out to Mike uh, about this particular topic, because I, I do think it's important for, uh, for them to weigh yeah, in. Cause that, that, right. that, that was my understanding. And again, I'm not a lawyer and I could, that just could be wrong, but I had always, uh, been given to understand that when you make a contribution, any, you know, whether it's the initial, you know, blurt of code or whether you add a new feature or whatever, that you retain the copyright to that code. Um, I, I totally agree. If, if you, you know, some others come along and modify it, they should be able to add. And then if that, at that time we want to make it Hyperledger, I don't think that's probably a problem. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think we need to get a little bit of clarity on that. Yeah, let, let's, um, at least on the copyright thing, maybe we wait until we can yeah. get somebody on the call to, right. um, have this discussion with us, right? And the weigh in on actually what the, the legal, uh, requirements are from that perspective. Um, mm -hmm. maybe we, maybe we'll end up in the same place where we start talking about the license stuff too. Um, but <laughs> I think the, I'm hoping, like, Stuff is a little bit easier um, yeah because what we're recommending for new files that we add to, to the hyperledger repositories there is just to use the um, SPDX short identifiers inside of the the comments of whatever yeah. that that file is whether it's the source file or a documentation file right um, now this makes no claim as far as Chris your comment on the mailing list about you know whether or not you should also add the the glyph in the, the link to the license inside mm. of the actual uh, read the docs um, documentation, right? This is just really for the files itself to make sure that we have a reference for what license it's covered under. Um, and obviously, you, everybody on this call knows from the Hyperledger charter that we use Apache 2 for source code and um, the CC by 4 for documentation. So, um, and then obviously, you know, the, the license file uh, uh, the license of the file, regardless of how it's specified, whether it's specified by the, the short identifier or through the full text, right, shouldn't be modified unless it's agreed to by all contributors to the file. Okay. And then the, the question I had was also, so we've been going through and removing the old prose headers, you know, the Apache, you know, sort of mm -hmm. uh, two paragraph uh, license header. Um, and replacing that with the SPDX header doesn't change anything from a licensing perspective. Right. And, and that's okay. Yeah, it, it's not necessary, obviously, to make those changes, Chris, because, uh, um, you know, it's, it's obviously the same license, right? Um, but obviously, you know, uh, there's no, we haven't gone back to you guys and said, oh, that was a mistake, right? Don't do that. Yeah, um, okay. So. Yeah, but definitely not a requirement. So I, I know um, Sean had a question about like, hey, we think it's more clear to have the full text. Okay, um, you know, that's that's fine. Obviously, you know, there is a standard out there called SPDX that makes it easier for people just to type in and have one reference to where the license is. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that's important enough to, to argue that, you know, if you want to keep the full text. Um, that you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, comments, concerns? There, yeah. There's, uh, a, there's a legal organization called the Software Freedom Law Council. Yes. 
Um, I wonder whether they'll have an independent opinion on this. I'll be going to an event in Colombia this evening. And I'll, I'll try to talk to them about it. Well, I'm, I think Mike was the one that helped you with this, right, Tracy? And he's a member. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, he's been a member yeah. for quite a while. So. <laughs> Yeah, so we this this is uh, Mike Mike Dolan who's been helping us kind of come up with the the verbiage for this, right? And kind of where most yep. of this comes from. So we'll, we'll, I think what we'll do is table the um, the the copyright discussion. Obviously, uh, we'll get Mike on the call and and maybe have him weigh in on this as well. Hey Tracy, uh, this is Dave. Um, hey Dave. So we also have Mishi uh, who does all of our crypto compliance audits, right? And is representing us in that regard. We do have that legal resource available. Um, She's the head of uh, S SFLC. Yep, correct. Yeah, and so she's been helping me get all of the federal paperwork done for publishing um, crypto cryptographic software and stuff, getting that all in compliance with the government. So I just thought I'd throw it out there. I mean, if we do need more legal help, we could probably ask Mishi. We have her on retainer. Hey, Tracy, uh, this is Baho. I also want to ask uh, uh, if we have already had the, the license header, like the Apache license, it uh, um, guide how to distribute and use the source code. So is there any uh, additional specific purpose that we have to include the copyright declaration? Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> uh, again, okay. that I, I don't know. Um, it's just always been the case that both that those two things have existed in the header files for for um, for the the open source code. So um, I, I think that's another question that we can definitely ask um, of Mike. Yeah. Thanks. I, I'm, I'm assuming there is a, a good reason to have it, right? Uh, but uh, what that reason is, I don't know. All right, so we need to get feedback, certainly in the copyright. Is there any concern at all with using, uh, I know, you know, Fabric, we've been using the SPDX headers. Um, they work well. It's actually easier to search um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, you know, have some something in our CI that assures that there's a license header in every file. And SPDX is a hell of a lot easier to check than a bunch of pros. And um, so we've been we've been using it and and sort of transitioning to it. Anytime a file gets changed, we change the header to SPDX. <clears throat> Makes it easy to manage. So does this mean the SPDX uh, uh, header should be used on documentation like, uh, for example, the architecture working group papers, the, uh, yep. the, you know, identity working group papers, you know, those kind of things. Yeah, any, any source uh, for that documentation should have that. I know that in the latest architecture uh, white paper, there was a specific call out uh, about that it was covered under the Creative Commons uh, attribution right. international 4.0. Um, so, yeah, we're, we, we've been trying to include that. Should we also put those um, in, in like uh, notes and scratch documents or draft stuff as well, like the Google Docs that we have that we're using? Mm. I, it wouldn't I'm hurt. I'm assuming we should put the CCL at least in there. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't hurt. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I noticed that the wiki has um, a, a, a footer. So yep. I think that covers that. Okay. Any other comments, questions, concerns? If not, we'll give people 24 minutes back on their calendars. All right. I will talk to you all next week. Thanks for coming. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.